subscribe to our youtube channel and click the bell icon hello everybody i am delighted to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture being conducted by the indian feminist judgments initiative in partnership with bar and bench the indian feminist judgments initiative aims to answer the question of whether indian jurisprudence would be significantly different if judges used feminist approaches and perspectives while deciding cases inspired by sister projects across the world and in india the initiative seeks to bring together a group of academics practitioners and students to rewrite significant judgments of the supreme court and high courts that have had serious implications on the state of gender justice in india today we are delighted to have with us professor rosemary hunter professor of law at university of kent law school Professor Hunter has been a source of inspiration for many of us across the globe interested in feminist legal scholarship. She was one of the co-organizers of the UK Feminist Judgments Project in which a group of academics and practitioners wrote alternative judgments in a series of key cases in English law. She has subsequently co-organized feminist judgment projects in Australia and New Zealand and has supported and advised similar projects in the USA and Northern Ireland among others. today she shall be speaking on the topic of an introduction to the feminist judgments project we thank you for taking the time to do this professor i would uh, request all the participants to send in any questions they might have during the lecture so that we can get to the questions right after without any delay and uh, with that over to you professor i will unmute myself first rule of zoom conferences Um thank you Raghav and thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm really delighted to be speaking to and um facilitating and supporting a new feminist judgments project. Um and uh, as Raghav mentioned this is one of several now that I've been um had some involvement in and it's always very interesting to see how the projects develop and construct their own identity. and uh and make a contribution to this what has become a a worldwide phenomenon um of the feminist rewriting um judgment project so what i'm going to do i've got a powerpoint presentation so i'm going to share my screen um so that i can talk through my powerpoints and then um obviously at the end of that i'm very happy to answer questions that you might have for me um and uh we'll take it from there right okay share the screen and i'll just make that into a full presentation okay right so the basic premise of all of the feminist judgment projects has been a similar one that is to observe that feminist jurisprudence has um you know been very widely embraced uh in the academy in legal education but has had a limited impact on judicial decision making and so rather than waiting the however many hundred years it will take um in order to see numbers of feminist judges and it's not to say that there are no feminist judges um in reality and part of my project currently is to document and and discover um feminist judges actually in in real life if you like um but this is going to take a long time for feminist jurisprudence to really make a difference to mainstream jurisprudence and so to help that process along um the the projects have generally taken the approach of imagining a judge in a particular case taking a feminist perspective on that case and thinking about how he or she would decide that case if they were bringing a feminist consciousness to the issues involved in that in that case now usually the judgment is rewritten as at the time that the original case was decided and it's done subject to the same constraints as the original decision makers were working under so it's dealing with the state of the law in its as it stood at the time with the state of facts and knowledge that the court had before it and responding to the same arguments that were put to the court and also that judge observing the same norms of 
judicial decision making. Um, often the, those norms are jurisdiction specific, but thinking about the ways in which judges feel themselves constrained um, within uh, their ju judicial roles so that they are deciding according to law, um, they're without fear or favour, without partiality for any of the litigants, um, and, uh, and you know, in, in a completely independent way. So observing all of those um, norms that form part of the judicial oath. And if all of those, within, if you're working within all of those constraints and can nevertheless produce a different decision by bringing a feminist perspective to bear on the case, then that's a very powerful way of demonstrating that cases could have been decided differently. That is, demonstrating that decisions are contingent rather than inevitable. That the, the decision that was reached by the original court was not the only decision that could have been made, um, but it could have been decided differently, and particularly in the context of feminist judgment projects, it could have been decided more inclusively um, by taking into account the position, the experience, the, um, the lives of traditionally marginalised subjects. Um, women, obviously, but feminist judgment projects have generally taken an intersectional approach and, um, and have been concerned about other forms of marginalisation as well as gender. Okay, so within those basic premises or with those basic premises as, as the sort of fundamental building blocks of the feminist judgment projects, each project has also taken its own different um, intellectual approach. So they, the, the projects have had different intellectual trajectories and different intellectual objectives. So that the founding project in this series of, of feminist re, uh, judgment rewriting projects was um, the Women's Court of Canada, which uh, was set up from a group of academics and activists in Canada in the um, sort of early 2000, uh, 2010, oh, I'm trying, no, 2000s, that's right, I'm just trying, it's been going for well over 10 years now. Um, and their particular concern was with the quality jurisprudence of the Canadian Supreme Court. Um, and so they had been trying as activists um, and as litigators to make interventions into um, court decisions, Supreme Court decisions on equality. And they felt that the court had stopped listening to them. And they were looking for a new way of putting their arguments to the court about the way that equality jurisprudence should be developed and particularly um, the, the need to develop a substantive conception of equality in the interpretation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms rather than um, the the sort of more formal or more narrow approaches that the court, they felt the court was, was taking. And so they came up with the idea of, rather than simply putting arguments to the court, of showing the court how it should be done. So saying, right, if we were writing this judgment, if we had been writing this decision, this is how we would have written it. And so that their particular project was obviously to influence the Supreme Court in the way that it developed its equality jurisprudence. The next project, which was the English project, which is the one that I set up with my two colleagues, um, Claire McGlynn and Erica Rackley, um, had a much wider remit. So we took a much broader approach. So rather than thinking about a specific line of jurisprudence or a specific area of judicial decision making, we were interested more broadly about putting feminist theory into practice in English law. Um, so we did not confine the scope of our project to um, a particular level of court, although in practice it ended up being the appellate decisions of the Court of Appeal or the, or the, the, the then House of Lords um, in the UK. But we, we didn't confine it to any particular subject matter either, so we left it to judgment writers to decide what kind of subject matter they wanted to um, tackle. And what we were interested in doing um, intellectually was sort of exploring the scope for writing feminist judgments, um, 
how much freedom did judges have to write in the way that they wanted to, to reach the conclusion that they wanted to? Were there limits to that? If so, what were the nature of those limits? Um, and in the course of doing that, we found ourselves exploring um, methods of, dis of judgment writing. So exploring methods of judicial reasoning and persuasion and developing a kind of toolkit for feminist judicial reasoning um, in terms of the ways in which uh, a feminist approach uh, or, or sort of the, the feminist reasoning might be inserted into the text of the law um, in a way that was seamless, in a way that fitted in with um, existing modes of, of judicial reasoning and persuasion. And so that, that in, involved us in analysing quite closely the way that judges reason and persuade and then finding our own twist on that that would be amenable to making feminist arguments. Then um, we moved to the Australian and the New Zealand projects. And these projects differed again. So the Australian Feminist Judgments Project um, took as its particular concern an interest in the thinking about the extent to which feminist jurisprudence had already influenced Australian law. So as part of the project, as well as actually rewriting judgments, we um, interviewed a number of judges and also did some mapping of areas of law that had been influenced by feminist jurisprudence. So things like sexual harassment, sexually transmitted debt, um, equal pay. Um, we sort of drew, built some maps of ways in which feminist juris jurisprudence were tracking the ways in which feminist jurisprudence had been imported into um, various areas of law. We talked to judges who were willing to um, identify, certainly in a confidential and anonymous interview, um, that they took a feminist approach or were interested in taking a feminist approach and talked to them about how they did so and, you know, the areas where they they thought a, prim, a feminist approach could be brought in and how and the sort of mechanisms for doing that. And then the book that we produced, the, the Australian Feminist Judgments book, was a, was a sort of third pro product of that project. And in that book, um, we didn't confine ourselves to appellate decisions. So we also included some first instance decisions and that brought in a different range of considerations about fact finding and the way in which judges make decisions about facts as well as about law. Um, and we, there was also um, an emphasis in particular at the beginning and, and end of the book on the position of Indigenous people in Australian law, so Indigenous women in Australian law, um, and the ways in which they did or, or were felt able to engage with a project of rewriting the sort of settler colonial law. Um, and so there's some sort of interesting reflections in that book about the position of Indigenous peoples vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the sort of the colonial law, the law that was imposed. Um, and the extent to which they might be interested in rewriting or completely rejecting um, that law or, or rethinking it in much more fundamental ways. Um, the New Zealand project followed on from that in a way by, by taking the, the position of Indigenous women um, and developing it much more uh, extensively. So um, New Zealand is a, talks about itself as a bicultural country. So between Pakeha, white settler, people and um, Māori, who are the Indigenous people in New Zealand. And um, the, so one of the things that the participants in that project did was develop a kind of Māori women's jurisprudence and then apply it to existing decisions that had involved Māori women as protagonists, as defendants or as claimants or defendant, uh, you know, respondents in particular. Cases. And so a very substantial part of that book is about the, the development of and the, the um, elaboration of what they called um, mana wahine judgments. So there's a mana wahine is a Māori term which loosely translates as the power or the authority of women. 
so they they didn't necessarily want to call it feminist, um, which has a set of um, you know different connotations, but they wanted to assert and to um, uh, think through the implications of a very of specific Maori women's jurisprudence, um, which could then be applied to the judging in relation to Maori women. So that's a very sort of significant development that was included in that book. And the, the, the two-stranded rope refers to the ways in which the sort of Pākehā jurisprudence and, and Māori jurisprudence um, are intertwined with each other throughout the book. Um, and so that, that was a, a part of that project. Um, then moving on to the, uh, the US and the Northern Irish project. So the you know, USA um, project went back to, I suppose, closer to the Canadian roots of the feminist judgment project in focusing its concern with the United States Supreme Court. So with the jurisprudence of a particular court um, and very often, not entirely, but very often the cases that are considered are constitutional decisions um, by the United States Supreme Court. Um, so obviously, the United States being a very large jurisdiction and they, they were wanting to find a way of um, focusing the book and, and making sure that it, that it was coherent and had a coherent focus. And so they focused on key decisions of the United States Supreme Court that concerned gender equality um, and other sort of gender related issues. And th those were the, the judgments that they decided to rewrite. Um, so again, it wasn't a particular part of the constitution. So it wasn't as in with the Canadian um, case focusing on a particular section or, or um, clause of the Bill of Rights, for example, but it was, did focus on the, on the US Supreme Court. Um, and then the, the Irish, the Northern slash Irish Feminist Judgments Project was an interesting one because it combined two jurisdictions. So it combined the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, which of course is part of the United Kingdom rather than part of Ireland, and looked at the commonalities um, between those two jurisdictions. Um, and in particular, thinking about um, the kind of the role of the judiciary in Ireland and in Northern Ireland in developing and framing and positing a kind of national consciousness. So, um, and thinking about the sort of the politics of national identity um, in the, and the way that the judiciary had contributed to that politics of national identity. And in particular, noting the ways in which that the, the version of national identity um, that had been forged by a series of um, you know, leading cases in the law of both jurisdictions was a very gendered um, conception of identity. So it, it contained very specific gender roles um, for, you know, different roles for men and women. And in particular, I mean, the, the Irish constitution um, is very uh, specific in framing women as the guardians of the home and the bearers of children. Um, and of course, the constitution is also um, up until recently uh, protected the right to life of the fetus. And so there's, there's an, a lot of ways in which women were consigned to a very restricted gender role within the sort of national consciousness and within judicial consciousness and within, you know, within therefore sort of jurisprudence um, in those two jurisdictions. And of course, so that gave the um, participants in the Northern Irish project a great deal of um, material that they wanted to push against, you know, that they, they, there were many cases that they could have rewritten and that they, quite a large book that they did rewrite, which contested the kind of the construction of gender roles um, of normative gender roles within the sort of Irish national um, identity. So, um, so that was a very sort of interesting, um, and that, that's the thing that gave that project its particular coherence. Um, and then the, the most recent books that have been published 
uh, by the Feminist International Judgments Project or Feminist Judgments in International Law and the Scottish Feminist Judgments Project. Um, the International Law Project dealt with a series of different courts and tribunals in international law. So obviously the, um, the International Court of Justice, but also um, regional courts, so the European Court of Justice, the Inter-American um, uh, Commission, uh, the, and um, specific tribunals, international um, criminal tribunals for Rwanda and Yugoslavia, um, and uh, some of the trade bodies, um, WTO decisions. So it, it pulled together, um, obviously also the International Criminal Court, pulled together a range of different international courts and tribunals and was also um, took an approach that mirrored the general approach of those courts and tribunals, which is to decide in chambers rather than to have individual judges writing, judge, uh, writing their own judgments. So um, it was, they were sort of collective judgments um, written by you know, two or three or four people rather than, than individual judgments. So they reflected the, the decision-making practices of the courts and tribunals that they were rewriting um, you know, to make, again, make those judgments as authentic as possible. Um, and they they range across a, a quite a wide range of issues within international law, um, including some very sort of basic conceptual issues. You know the whole Westphalian notion of you know the state as the centre of um, of international law, and the the perhaps questioning that and thinking about the way that the international law extends to and relates to individuals and, and other kinds of non-state entities. Um, and then, you know, rethinking a range of specific things that impact on, um, well, both human rights judgments and, and more general things that impact on differently situated um, individuals who are the subject of um, international law, particularly international criminal law. And then the Scottish Feminist Judgments Project, um, one of the things that they were particularly interested in, so um, you, you might not be aware, but Scotland is actually a different jurisdiction from that of England and Wales um, and Northern Ireland. So the UK is, you know, the sort of four countries that make up the UK have different legal systems in some important respects. So in some areas it's a unified legal system and in some areas it's different um, and so there is a Scottish law that you can write Scottish judgments about and there's a sort of Scottish judicial hierarchy um, but the particular interest that the organizers of this project has was was in thinking about um, the I suppose the relations between law and culture and in particular the relations between law and art and performance and um, you know, so law as a as a performance and as a cultural product, and how that other kinds of cultural production um, might reflect on law, or how law might relate to them. And so they included in the project um, a, a number of artists um, who wrote things, who rewrote judgments, if you like, or who thought about the judgments from their own artistic perspective and who produced um, choral works and artworks and um, uh, other kinds of sort of performances uh, as well alongside the actual rewritten judgments. And so um, the, those two things speak to each other very interestingly and sort of open up different ways of thinking about law and also cause us to reflect on the way the sort of the way that law's knowledge um, and you know particularly in this context law's knowledge about gender and gendered lives is very limited very linear um, very one-dimensional um, very um, sort of enlightenment liberal um, and very uh, I suppose intellectual as opposed to emotional um, so the, the sort of whole notion of legal objectivity is something that is then 
questioned and uh, and interrogated through its juxtaposition with with works of art which often present more um, more sort of visceral and more felt um, responses to the predicaments of the people whose cases were brought before the court. So it sort of shows two different ways of responding to to those people and to and to the issues that the court was deciding. So that's a very sort of interesting and different approach. And the the organisers that have written um, a recent article about that, which explains it in more detail. So that's you know a sort of range of different intellectual projects. And obviously one of the things that you're going to be doing in your project is thinking about well what is the thing that makes your project can hit cohere? What is the the particular intellectual um, uh, contribution that you are trying to make um, in the kind of uh, you know, how how are you going to add to the global feminist judgments phenomenon? What's your particular take and your particular perspective um, that you want to bring across that the judgments collectively contribute to? Um, and I should also say that there are a number of other judgment projects under construction, um, as well as the the. I mean, you'll be aware of both your own project and, and another um, Indian Feminist Judgments project. There is an African Feminist Judgments project currently going. So that's something that is designed to cover um, the, the African continent. So it's not you know, within a particular country, but more broadly. Um, in Canada, they have gone back and are now working on a Feminist Judgments project rather than the original Women's Court of Canada. So the um, rather than confining itself to a particular area of jurisprudence, it's doing the, the same thing as other feminist judgment projects have done and, and opening up more broadly to think about the broad range of Canadian law uh, rather than, than this, the jurisprudence, the equality jurisprudence of the Canadian Supreme Court. And there's also that funny little one down in the, well, it's not that little, um, bottom right hand uh, corner of the slide, which is Central and Eastern Europe. So there is a, a project currently underway thinking about feminist judgments in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and of course, this is an issue that, um, apart from the International Judgments Project, the, the way in which feminist judgments might apply in civil law systems as opposed to common law systems is, a, is an interesting question because of course the whole norms of judicial decision making and the notion of what a judgment is differ um, and create perhaps less scope for individual judicial voices or for judges thinking about the law differently. Um, and so that's a, that's a challenge that's being faced by them. And there have been a, number, a couple of other projects that have been attempted within civil law systems um, in Germany, in um, Central America, but that haven't really got very far. So we'll see, I'm, I'm hopeful um, that this one will, will come to fruition and we'll be able to see you know, how the project and how the thinking operates in that particular context. Right, um, and then the other thing that I should, that, that you might find interesting is that as well as having feminist judgment projects, um, there have also been a number of people who have just written individual feminist judgments, so individual writers, individual scholars who have written a feminist judgment um, in order to, to make a particular point or as part of their scholarship more generally. And the two, there are, there are a number of these now, but the two that I draw your attention to particularly are two that relate to Indian law. So um, Madhu Mukherjee, um, who was a, she was a um, PhD student at the University of Kent a number of years ago, um, and she wrote her thesis on um, sort of the law on sexual violence against women, and her particular concern was the way in which women were not treated, or her argument was that women were not treated as legal persons in, um, in the sort of sexual offences law. And, so, and part of her, as part of her thesis, she wrote a chapter which was a feminist judgment, which um, rewrote the judgment in Sakshi versus Union of India. And, uh, and then she published that judgment separately in Feminist at Law, which is an online open access journal. So you can find that very easily if you Google Feminist at Law or Google Mukherjee or you know, any of those words, you will find um, that judgment. And then most recently, uh, another 
another rewritten Indian judgment by another Kent PhD student, so G. Similar, um, who's one of our current PhD students, and he has written a, rewritten the judgment um, in uh, Navtaj Singh and Union of India. Uh, with, and his particular concern is to to reintroduce the issue of caste into the court's consideration in thinking about the issues in that case. And his uh, rewritten judgment has just been published um, in the NUJS Law Review. So again, again, that's online, it's freely accessible. Um, so that's another one that you might be interested in looking at. In terms of the process of crafting your judgment, um, I think the first question is, well, are you going to produce a whole new judgment or are you going to take the original judgment and edit it? So most of the feminist judgment projects, in fact, in fact, all of the projects calling themselves feminist judgment projects, have involved rewriting judgments from the beginning. So just taking the facts of the particular issues and, and writing the whole judgment from beginning to end. Um, but there is an alternative to that, which is to take the original judgment and make some limited changes um, to some of the paragraphs in order to, um, you know, I suppose, demonstrate even more clearly the ways in which just changing a few words or some sentences might make uh, a significant difference. So this was an approach that was taken by a project um, called Diversity in European Human Rights. So it, was, it wasn't a, a specifically feminist project. The, um, the aim of this particular project was to demonstrate to the European Court of Human Rights how it could um, take uh, diversity more seriously, how it could reflect um, the concerns of diverse constituencies um, more fully in its decision making on um, European human rights. So the, the particular um, groups that it was looked at were, I think there was women, children, Roma people, people with disabilities, sexuality, I think was included in there. Um, and so what, what they did in that particular decision was just take the original judgment and edit it. And so a lot of the um, original judgment remained intact, but they deleted some bits, added a few bits of their own. Um, so they were, again, sort of really showing the court how these relatively small changes could make a big difference to the reasoning and to the outcomes for these particular um, diversity groups. Um, now, that, that, that's one way of going about it. I think that there's, there's obvious constraints that that imposes because you end up still speaking in the voice of the original court, which is not necessarily what you want to do. And it means that the judgment ends up being organised in the way that the original court. So there's a very sort of standard template for the way in which European human rights, um, the Court of Human Rights writes its judgments. Um, and so it's not going to change that, but it's not something that you necessarily want. That's a straitjacket that you don't necessarily need to be constrained by. And in fact, what a lot of the feminist judgments have done is change the way, change the sort of order of the argument or change the way in which the judgment is written, because often judgments um, start out from the, the issues. So, you know, the issue in this case, the legal issue in this case is da 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 da, and then the facts might be dealt with fairly briefly. And then often in the feminist judgments, what they're wanting to do is to tell the story differently and to highlight the kind of marginalised experience that is being continually marginalised, continues to be marginalised in the, in the original judgment. And so you might want to put the story up front um, or the facts up front rather than the, um, the issues. So but that, that is just another way of doing it. Um, the other, I guess, issue that... Uh, is going to come up when you're writing your feminist judgment is that I'm sure that you will be given a word limit um, and that means that you can't necessarily address all of the issues that you might want to address. You can't necessarily rewrite everything that was in the original decision. You may have to choose or focus on a smaller number of issues which are the ones that you particularly want to 
engage in different reasoning about um, rather than necessarily all of them. So obviously, real judges aren't constrained by word limits, but you will be. And so that I mean, one of the things that um, in in producing your judgment for this project, you will have to um, I think almost inevitably bear in mind. Um, second question is about the result of the case. Now, um, the Obviously, the theory of judgment writing is that we, you know, we take the facts and we take the law and we apply the law to the facts and out comes the answer. Um, now, that's a bit of a fiction. Um, and we know that many real judges decide what result they want and then get there, uh, you know, write the judgment to produce that result. Uh, and certainly in the feminist judgments projects, that is very often what the feminist judge is doing. So they're saying, you know, the reason I want to rewrite this case is because I want to reach a different result. Um, or I want to, um, I'm happy to reach the same result, but the reasoning that I'm going to employ to get to that outcome is going to be quite different. Um, so in that situation, you, what you're doing is effectively deciding the result and then reasoning your way there. Now, if you um, and, and you know using the a reasoning that will enable you to to reach that different result, um, one of the things that the judges in our project found was that they couldn't always you know they decided on the result they decided on the result that they wanted and then they couldn't get there. Um, so you cannot always get to the result you want. So the, the law is. Open textured, it gives you lots of scope for bringing in feminist reasoning, but there are limits to it, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so you cannot always make the law go where you want it to be. Um, and the, the particular example of that was in the English project. Um, it was a discrimination case. It was a case about um, a local swimming pool, which uh, gave a discount, a, you know, an age discount to women when they reach 60 and to men when they reach 65, which reflected the then differential pension age um, in, the, in the UK. And, and a man complained that this was sex discrimination, that, you know, he was 62 and his wife was 60 and she got a discount and he didn't. Um, and the court, the feminist judge, wanted to say this is not discrimination you know that when we are interpreting the concept of discrimination we have to look at um you know whether it is whether the the difference in treatment that is being complained about you know has the effect of perpetuating historical disadvantage or subordinating um a particular group or whether it in fact has the effect of compensating for that. So the, the, the reason for the differential age um, the di at which a discount was available was because men and women were treated differently in relation to pensions. And so reflecting that was legitimate um, and failing to reflect that would in fact be discriminating against women. And so the, that's what the judge wanted to say but she found that, um, you know, within the terms of the legislation that she was dealing with, the UK, the then Sex Discrimination Act, she, the law just would not let her get to that result. I mean, the law was, it, the definition of direct discrimination was utterly clear, unambiguous, and could not be interpreted in the way that she wanted it to. Um, and so what she ended up doing in that situation was to say, um, was to sort of, to say, I would have liked to reach this decision, but the legislation is is clearly, you know, doesn't allow me to reach that decision. The inevitable result of the legislation is that this is sex discrimination, and um, but it it is not um, directing itself at things that I would prefer the legislation to be directing itself at. And uh, and therefore, you know, she all she could do was to call on the legislature to change the law um, in order to reflect the approach that she thought would be preferable. Um, the other approach, 
is to, and this is again something that was taken by some of the people in our project, where they just said, well, actually, I don't know what result I particularly want. I'm just interested in this issue and the issues that's raised in this case. And I want to see if I apply a feminist perspective where that will lead me in terms of the result. You know, if I, if I, just, so I, I just start from the beginning, start from the issue and reason my way to the end. Um, and let's see where we end up. And you can, if you do that, you might be surprised at where you end up. Um, even you know, bringing a feminist um, perspective to bear. Uh, you may end up in exactly the same place, you may end up in, in quite a different place from where you thought you might do. Um, so that, I mean, there, there, are, there are two perfectly legitimate ways of going about the, the, your writing your judgment. Um, I suspect that most of you will do the first one, so you'll know what result you want and then work out how to get there, um, rather than having a completely open mind from the beginning and seeing where you get to. But either way, by the end of it, you have to have reached a decision. And this is something that I think some, again, in a number of the projects, people who are academics have found difficulties doing. So as academics, we're often interested in the possibilities and the options, you know, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. You know, this raises an interesting question. What might be the, the, the result if you did this? Um, you know, it could go this way, it could go that way. You can't do that as a judge. Um, as a judge, you have to decide. And so wherever you have started from, when you get to the end, you have to have a decision and you have to have decided for one or other of the parties um, and you have to make that clear in your judgment and that as I said that's something that people some academics have found difficult to do so be aware of that potential difficulty and be aware um, that you do ultimately have the responsibility of making a decision and deciding against someone as well as for someone. In terms of the types of judgments that you can write, now obviously, um, again, many of the feminist judgments have been dissenting judgments. So you are being an additional judge on the same court, reaching a different result from the result that the rest of the court or the majority of the court reached. Um, but it's certainly possible for, and, and many feminist judgments have been, concurring judgments. So this is where you're an additional judge reaching the same result as the original decision or the original majority, but by means of different reasoning. So you are reaching the same outcome, you're deciding for the same party, but the route that you take to get there is a feminist one rather than a non-feminist one. So you are flagging issues, you're raising issues, you're noticing things, you're, you know, excluding perhaps some reasoning that was particularly stereotypical or particularly egregious or particularly damaging um, because you want you, the, the result is okay, but what you're trying to do and the difference you're trying to make is the reasoning that is used by the court. Um, another possibility, and I'm not sure whether this is going to be a possibility within your um, uh, project, but it's sort of alternative or substitute judgment. So where the court only issues one judgment, then a feminist rewriting necessarily involves a replacement of that judgment with a different judgment. So this was often the case with, with some of the international tribunals where the court simply issues one, one judgment and what the feminist judgment did was replace that judgment so to, to say not, you know, I disagree with the other members of the court, but this is the alternative judgment. Um, and again, if you're if you're a single judge at first instance, um, then all you can do is to replace the original judgment rather than, than be an additional judge. And then there's also the possibility, which has been used less often, of writing the leading judgment in a fictional appeal. So in fact, this was the model that was originally used by the Women's Court of Canada, because the Women's Court of Canada, um, they imagined as a, a review so a court that was reviewing decisions, so sitting above the Supreme Court of Canada and reviewing the decisions of the Supreme Court, and therefore there was a sort of fictional appeal to this court. Um, and in the English project, we used this technique a couple of times, 
in order to get around um, awkward precedents. So in the U, uh, UK, in, sorry, England and Wales Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal is bound by its own previous decisions. So if um, a, a feminist judge was sit also sitting as an alternative judgment judge in the Court of Appeal, they would still be bound by the previous decision that they wanted to get away from. And so they, in that situation, imagined an appeal to the Supreme Court and wrote the judgment in that fictional appeal. So that's that's obviously, um, you know, it, it solves one problem and it creates another because it doesn't then have the effect of, of you know, doing that thing of showing how the original decision could have been rewritten differently because it couldn't have been. Um, but it might be the mechanism that you need in some cases to get you to, to where you want to go. Um, in terms of the style, again, if you're, if you're aiming for um, plausibility, if you're aiming to show that um, your judgments would have been equally plausible as judgments in the original case, then it has to sound like and look like a judgment that could have been written by the original court. So research your court's judgments. Um, does it permit multiple judgments? In, in your case, that would generally be the case, but in some other projects, that hasn't been the case. Um, how do judges refer to each other? What are the norms of politeness or impoliteness? I mean, the sort of the members of the United States Supreme Court are famously rude to each other um, when referring to each other in their judgments if they disagree. Um, by contrast, in you know other jurisdictions in the in um, on the UK Supreme Court, they're incredibly polite to each other and and almost obsequious to each other um, while completely disagreeing with them. Um, so you know how does your court typically write? How much really important question? How much dialogue is there between judges in their judgments? Um, because I mean one of the issues that often comes out in feminist judgment projects is that because we're academics and because we're used to writing critical essays, the, the way that we write critical essays is to say, so-and-so argues this, and then to show why they're wrong. Um, and so in the feminist judgment project, sometimes people have emulated that kind of style in their judgments to say, you know, judge X says this, judge Y says this, but, you know, they're wrong because of wah, 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 and this is the answer. Um, but of course, that, that never actually happens or very rarely actually happens in judgments. Judges don't reproduce and take to pieces the judgment that has been written by the other judges. They just write their own judgment. Um, and so while you might say, I disagree with, or for the reasons that I will shortly give, I have reached a different conclusion. But you don't go into detail about you know, unpacking the statements that were made in the other judgments. Um, and so be aware of what's the norm on your court. It might be that judges do that, in which case, fine. But generally, judges tend not to do that in their judgments, and therefore you need to be aware of not doing that. Um, how does, if you want to bring in um, non-legal materials, how does the court generally do that? How does the court refer to legal materials? Does it use footnotes? Does it put things in the text? Um, does it uh, quote at length? Does it tend not to do that? You know, how does it quote and so on? Uh, but I would also, at the same time as saying, make your judgment plausible, there's a sense in which perhaps you don't want it to sound like the original judgment, which is um, that you don't want to emulate the court. If the court has a very convoluted style, if the court is typically poor reason, <laughs> um, if judgments typically have great gaps in the reasoning or are very indirect, then that's probably something that you don't want to emulate um, and you should try to be as clear and direct as you can because you are trying to get across. People aren't reading your judgments because they have to. You want to make the point um, as clearly as you possibly can in the form of a judgment, but nonetheless in the form of a very accessible judgment. Um, and then one of the things that people have also, or some um, academics have found hard to do is just find a judicial voice. So find a way of writing that sounds like you, that is the way that enables you to express your opinions as a judge. Uh, and in the Australian book, there's a, one of the, um, we actually 
as well as interviewing real judges, we we that we talked to and interviewed the um, the feminist judges, and then the second chapter of that book sort of talks about the the kind of challenges that they faced in writing their judgments and how they overcame them and how they addressed them, and and one of them is one of the issues that people raised quite often was this issue about finding their judicial voice and you know how they could become if not comfortable, at least um, slip themselves into the style of it was as one group of um, judges, uh, feminist judges wrote, sort of putting on the judicial robes and how they, they found the robes uncomfortable, but they found a way of being a judge, which is perhaps different from the persona that you would normally um, be conveying in your academic work. Um, in terms of the things that need to be in a judgment, so the judgment has to be obviously legally competent. Um, so you have to get the law right. You have to address the issues that are raised by the parties. You have to, as I said earlier, include a decision, a disposition, you know, who is going to win, what are the orders, how is the court's decision going to be put into effect. And the judgment has to speak for itself. So it has to be wholly self-contained, it can't rely on other sources to make sense of it. So some of the sort of key differences from an academic essay, and I've mentioned some of them already, but one, one of them is that the theory that you're applying is likely to remain implicit. So you should not go into a great exposition of feminist theory in the judgment. Um, so you, you might have that the ideas in your head, but what comes out in the judgment is a reflection of those ideas rather than a representation of those ideas. So your theory is going to remain implicit um, rather than being explicit on the face of the judgment. And as I said earlier, you want to decide the case for yourself, applying your own analysis rather than spending a lot of time arguing with and um, deconstructing the reasoning of the other judges in the case. So you can obviously say that you disagree with them, but not at the kind of length that you would do in an academic essay. Um, feminist judges often want to introduce contextual materials to show the sort of social context and the uh, in which particular laws might have been made or in which people, the, the factual issues have arisen. Can you do that? How does the court do that? Um, Know, what's the most appropriate way of doing that? Can you take judicial notice of things? So is there a doctrine of judicial notice which enables you to bring in information without having to have that put to you in argument by the parties? Um, is it helpful to make obiter comments? You know, I am surprised that this, so if, if you're bound by or restricted by the issues that are raised by the parties, but you would actually like to address another issue, then you can say in obiter, I'm surprised that none of the parties raised before us this particular issue and, you know, out a few paragraphs of, of, of that kind, just to flag, you know, for the future that this is something that, uh, the kind of argument that might be useful. Um, now, I know that you're having commentaries as well as the main judgment, and so there are obviously some key things that a commentary needs to do. Um, I mean, the main uh, aim of a commentary, certainly, our conception of it, and we were the ones who, in the English project, who sort of introduced the idea of a separate commentary, was to make the rewritten judgment accessible for non-specialist readers, and especially for students who won't necessarily know the law um, or the, you know, have the sort of background to the case and won't know and won't know the content of the case. So you need to explain the facts and the issues that were involved in the case, you need to explain the original decision and how it was received. So, you know, was this something, if it, if, if it was a high profile decision, you know, was it generally applauded? Was it generally deplored? Um, you know, is it seen as an important decision? You know, did it create controversy? So if, if that's the case, then it's, it's useful to include that in the commentary. And then your commentary also comments on the rewritten judgment. So you need to explain what the rewritten judgment does differently from the original judgment. So set that out clearly because obviously in the judgment itself it can't do that. And also 
explain how the rewritten judgment is feminist, you know, so to connect it to feminist theory in a way, again, that the judge themselves can't do. So um, that last stop point there enables you, the commentary, the commentator, and sometimes the, the feminist judge, the person who's rewritten the judgment, might ask the commentator specifically refer to it. They say, you know, I've been inspired by or I've been, um, I've made particular use of these particular theoretical work or this particular scholarship. Um, and that can be included in the commentary in a way that the judge can't put it in their judgment. So the commentary can be a place where the kind of underpinning literature for the rewritten feminist judgment can be set out for other people to refer to. And then finally, um, uh, Raghav asked me to talk about the potential impacts of feminist judgment projects. Um, and I think there's a, perhaps a difference between the potential impacts and the actual impacts. Um, so obviously one of the things that we set out to, to, to do was to bring our judgments to the attention of judges, real judges, in the hope that they would take notice and change the way that they make their decisions. Now, I can't say that we've been terrifically successful in doing that. I mean, there are certainly some judges who have noticed the project, have been very supportive of the project, have been interested in it, um, have been happy to discuss it. Um, I'm not too sure about the extent to which um, it has changed their minds, although I'm also aware, I mean, some judges have said to me that it has changed their minds about how they judge and change their approach to judging. And, uh, and they, have, they have started to think about things that they wouldn't have thought about previously. So that, you know, that's nice to know it's on a relatively small scale, but it is something that can happen. Um, a second possibility is the inclusion of feminist judgments in judicial education programs. That's occurred to different degrees in different parts of the world. So, um, it hasn't happened very much in the UK that I'm aware of, but I've certainly, so I have gone to other places and have been asked to give lectures to judges in Bosnia and Herzegovina and other parts of the world um, where there are judicial education programs set up that have specifically addressed these issues. I think in the New, the New Zealand project has been quite successful in being included in their um, judicial education program generally. So there's, you know, that's varied, but that's another possibility. Third one is that lawyers will take notice of the project and start using the kinds of arguments in making arguments in real cases. Um, and especially, um, I think we've seen that social justice projects um, have taken up or been inspired by feminist judgment writing, rewriting to make different kinds of arguments or thought about ways in which they can make arguments to the court that, that draw attention to the gendered impacts of decisions or the context um, in which the, the particular issue arises. Um, and certainly in the Australian project, as I mentioned, we interviewed a number of judges and several of those judges said, well, I can only be a feminist judge if I've got feminist lawyers making arguments to me. So I need to be enabled as a feminist judge by having feminist arguments put to me by the lawyers in front of me. And so, you know, the sort of legal education, uh, uh, was sort of education for lawyers and, and encouraging lawyers to think about the kinds of arguments they make to courts is also a potential impact. And then even if um, you're not reaching any or many practicing lawyers, you do have a um, built-in audience, uh, which is your students. And so I think it's certainly true to say that um, feminist judgments have been used extensively in legal education um, in all of the, the jurisdictions where they have been um, uh, produced and are used to show students, you know, different ways of writing that, that decisions could have been made, demonstrating how feminist jurisprudence or feminist theory can be put into practice, feminist legal theory can be put into practice, um, thinking about different ways in which the court, the law might have developed, thinking about judicial um, uh, practices and the way that judges operate. So they can be very useful for a range of um, 
purposes in legal education, I'd say that's where their major impact has been so far. Okay, so I will finish there and I'm very happy to answer any of your questions. I'll just stop sharing my screen and we'll go back to speaking. Great. Okay, if you're on, uh, right, you're off mute. Thank you, Professor, for that very enriching talk. Uh, we have two questions so far. The first is, accessing original pleadings of cases in India is a difficult task and requires significant resources. When judgments being re rewritten are at an appellate stage, could you guide us on how one could rewrite judgments without access to the pleadings and arguments of the parties? And what was the experience of the UK project in this regard? Okay, so um, we very deliberately confined ourselves to using and drawing on only materials that were in the public domain. So as with you, we couldn't necessarily, we didn't have access to the case files, we didn't have access to the original pleadings. Um, so all we had was what the court said about the arguments that were put to them. So in some, sometimes in, judge, in the judgment itself, it will say, for the appellant, Mr. Blah Blah argued such and such. So when the court is setting out the arguments that were put to it, and I guess I'm not sure whether this is the case in the judgments that you're dealing with, but certainly in in English judgments, the sort of the, the standardly, the court will say this was the argument put by the appellant, this was the argument put by the respondent, this is how we decide. Um, so they tend to reproduce the arguments that were put to them. And that was the only information that we had to go on and we worked with that. Um, other than I think in a couple of cases where the person who was rewriting the judgment knew, you know, the lawyers from one side and got, you know, got a bit more information from them. But basically we were in, just entirely reliant on what was in the original judgment. And that was fine. You know, that, that, that was plenty to work with. In fact, in some ways, the less you have, the better, because the less constrained you are. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what sort of engagement should the judgment author and commentator have throughout the writing process? Okay, so I think it's it's very useful for um, the judgment and the commentator to, the judgment writer and the commentator to speak to each other as the judgment is developing. Um, so obviously all of those things that I said about what should be in the commentary, can, you can write the stuff about the, the original case, the, the facts and the issues and the original decision. You can write that, you know, without any correspondence with the judgment writer and you can write it straight up. You don't need to wait until the rewritten judgment in order to do that. But obviously you do need to wait for the rewritten judgment in order to be able to do the stuff about explaining the rewritten judgment. However, um, so I mean, certainly depending on how well you know the commentator, um, in some of the, the cases, and it sort of depends really on the, how, how people want to play it, so that there's no sort of hard and fast rule, but sometimes the judgment writer and the commentator have, have had an ongoing dialogue. So the judgment writer has said, you know, this is what I'm trying, what do you think of this, and sort of use them as a bit of a, um, a, a sounding board as they're in the process of writing the judgment. Um, and, and certainly we've had, situations where the, the, the thing that I mentioned at the end, where the judgment writer says to the commentator, you know, here's the material that I've used. I can't put this in my judgment, but can you please mention it in the commentary um, to make sure that it's acknowledged that I'm, you know, that there's an acknowledgement of the, the scholarship that I have relied on in, um, in writing this judgment. So it, it, it depends. Um, I don't think, as I said, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule for that, but it's a good idea to have an, uh, an ongoing dialogue. I mean, we have had the odd case where people haven't had much of a much connection with each other, and then the, the judgment writer produces the judgment and the commentator looks at it and decides they fundamentally disagree with it and um, write a commentary that says how much they disagree with the rewritten judgment. So you probably want to avoid that if at all possible, um, and because that, that could be a bit awkward. But in the, I mean, certainly in some of our cases, um, the commentator and the judgment writer 
had different perspectives on what a feminist judge might do. So obviously feminism is a broad, you know, theoretical position. It, it isn't just one thing. There isn't necessarily a singular feminist position on a number of issues. And sometimes the commentator and the judgment writer have had different feminist positions. And it's perfectly legitimate in that kind of situation for the commentator to include in their commentary saying, you know, a, some feminists would agree with this and some feminists would take a different approach and, you know, might say something different. So that that's actually quite useful because um, it demonstrates, again, you know, not, not just that the um, original judgment is contingent, but the feminist judgment is also contingent. It's contingent on the particular feminist position of that judge um, and, you know, not all feminists think the same. Thank you, Professor. We have uh, one final question. Um, how would you suggest feminists who may want to critique the process of decision making uh, reconcile themselves with it? Okay, yeah, now that this is a question that comes up in every single project. <laughs> um, and it, you, you've got a choice between, do you want to write a judgment that looks like, that is legible as a judgment in order to make the political point that judgments could be decided differently? Or do you want to upend the whole process of um, judicial decision-making and judgment writing from a feminist perspective? in which case you produce something completely different, um, but then you don't have that political effect of, you know, showing how it could be done differently and getting people to take it seriously. Because, you know, it's, it's like um, they're saying, well, you're not writing judgments anymore, so we don't have to take any notice. So that is a, that's a, a, a trade-off or a balance that you just have to make decisions about and that each project has had to make decisions about. And generally, I think we, we've said, well, look, you know, this project is about is not about questioning judgment writing per se. It might be questioning some aspects of judgment writing. Certainly, as I said, you might want to write judgments differently. You might want to order them differently. You don't want to be obscure and convoluted and, you know, badly reasoned. You don't want to be disrespectful or dismissive of parties. You want to write about people in ways that are um, ethically appropriate, um, but you don't want to do something that doesn't look like a judgment anymore. Um, and then I think there's a whole different project, which nobody has really done yet, um, about, right, let's think about what feminist judgment writing, as in, you know, if it's not a, within the, the current paradigm, but, you know, if you had a feminist legal system, you know, what would judgments look like within that? That would, that's, a, that's a whole different question. And in a way, what the Scottish project did was kind of balance those two things by having the judgments and the artwork. Um, and, and, and they invited the, the project participants, the judgment rewriters, to engage with the artwork and to engage with the artists and to contribute to the artwork, as, as well as, uh, you know, inviting the artists to contribute to the, to the rewritten judgments. So, it, in a sense, the, in the Scottish project, the, the book of rewritten judgments is the taking judgment for granted and doing that in a feminist way. And the artwork is the let's think of a completely different way of expressing ourselves. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for these very helpful insights and for your time. I'm sure our participants and viewers would have enjoyed this as much as I did as we continue to try to critique and engage with the law from a feminist lens. I thank our audience for attending this session and I thank Bar and Bench for their immense help in organizing it. And with that, we come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you to everybody again for attending. Thank you, Professor. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon.